Um, I'm going to uh, talk to you. There it goes. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about effort this morning. Um, this is a, my quick to-do list. Uh, we're gonna. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is effort. Um, how do we conceptualize effort? Uh, how do we measure effort? Going to spend a little bit of time talking about a research study that we have been in the process of, of doing here over the last couple of years. And then I, I always try in my, my presentations to give you a little bit of something that you could take home and put in your pocket. So I'm going to spend the last little section of the talk um, talking about how, what, what are some ways that we have found um, enhance effort. A number of years ago, I did a presentation where I um, told a story, and it was a, it was a presentation on, on engagement, and I was trying to sort of come up with a way for today's presentation to couch this idea of effort and couch it in the bigger picture of who we are and what we do. And so I'm going to start off with that same story that I told a number of years ago. Um, and the decision to tell this story sort of came out of a, a brain injury coping skills class that I did a couple of weeks ago. We were, I was talking with persons served in families about goal setting. Goal setting in, in rehabilitation, goal setting after brain injury. Some people respond very well to sort of concrete, smart goals, and other people respond better to um, maybe less well-defined goals, and I tend to be one of those people. I think more in terms of dreams. I have living dreams, I have loving dreams, and I have doing dreams. Living dreams sort of, I align my life, my decisions around where I want to live, where I want to be physically. Um, my loving dreams are all about how I align my decisions, I align my, my priorities around who I'm surrounded by. I want to be surrounded by specific people. Most of you in this room are on that list. Um, and doing dreams are all about purpose. How, how, what, what does my life mean? What, what am I, when, when this is all said and done, what do I want? What do, what do I want to have left behind? What do I want my purpose to have been? And so I make certain decisions and prioritize aspects of my life in order to, to achieve these or move toward these doing dreams. And when I was talking to the, the group about this, they asked what my doing dreams were. And I told this same story. Um, and, and so one day, and he falls into a hole. And he calls out for help, and pretty soon a physician walks by. And the physician looks down into the hole, and the man says, I'm stuck in a hole can you help me out? And the physician says, I know exactly what you need. And he writes a prescription and he drops it down into the hole and he walks away. And still stuck in the hole. And so he continues to call out and pretty soon a priest comes by. And the priest looks down into the hole and the man says, I'm stuck in a hole, can you help me out? And uh, the priest knows, I says, I know just what you need. And he uh, kneels down, he says a prayer, and then he walks on, goes on his way. Man's still stuck in the hole. Pretty soon a friend walks by, and the friend looks down into the hole, and the man says, I'm stuck in a hole, can you help me? And the friend jumps down into the hole, and the man says, what, what are you doing? Now we're both stuck in the hole. And the friend says, well, I, I've been here before. We'll find our way out together. And I think, when I think about my doing dreams, what, what I want to have left behind is a rehab world that is better focused on the climb, the, the, the skills that are required to jump down in that hole and to help people climb out with you. I want to better define the climb. And I, I, don't, I don't tell the story to 
disparage medicine or prescriptions or those kinds of things. It's, that's incredibly important. And I don't tell the story to disparage faith. That is a huge factor in, in improvement after brain injury. I tell it because we are trained and we live in a healthcare environment where we look down the hole and drop our interventions in. And what the people we serve need is for us to get down in that hole with them and help them find their way out. And there are specific skills, there are specific aspects of who we are and what we do that help build that ladder. And that's really what I, what I want, what, not just this presentation, but sort of the theme that I want in all of the presentations that you hear me give. Um, and effort is a, one of those building blocks. And so I want to sort of unpack effort and talk, talk a little bit about it with you this morning. So what is it? What is effort? There have been, you know, we've talked about effort and rehabilitation for a long time, um, but it's not been well defined. Um, it, it, sometimes you hear effort sort of used interchangeably with engagement, and there are engagement-based scales that, that, that are out there. Sometimes you hear it um, used interchangeably with participation, um, which is, that is confusing. Um, and there's general agreement that effort is not a construct in and of itself. Effort is the product of multiple constructs. And I'll unpack that here in, in the next slide. There are a number of rating scales that can be used to rate person-served effort, patient effort, as you, as you work with them. The most well-known is called the Rehabilitation Intensity of Therapy Scale. Um, this, and the, the reference is up there for you. Um, in about 2015, the, that paper was published and it looked at the psychometric properties of the Rehabilitation of Intensity Scale. And at the time, um, I, we needed an effort scale. This had not yet been published, and so we at On With Life developed our own level of effort scale, which I'm gonna, I'll go through briefly with you here in just, just a little bit. Um, but if you're interested in digging into effort or in, in looking at this topic of effort and, and better taking this subjective idea of effort and, and making it more objective through a rating scale, the rehab uh, intensity of therapy scale is an option. You're welcome to use the On With Life um, level of effort scale. That's free to you as well. Um, and uh, the bottom line is effort is not well studied. Um, it's not well understood. There have been a number of studies, uh, the, this, this one included. Um, the other major study was one called the TBI-PBE study that came out in 2016, I believe, where they looked at effort um, as a factor in rehabilitation at the acute level, at the inpatient hospital-based rehab. Um, but there's, it's really not been well studied at all in post-acute rehabilitation. So again, effort um, is not necessarily a construct in itself. It is the product of multiple constructs. So we look at how someone's cognitive and emotional status play into their ability to give effort in a, in a session. Um, obviously, individuals who have lower awareness, it's more difficult for them to put forth effort. Individuals who have some degree of agitation, restlessness, it's difficult for them to, to give effort. Um, there are also, there's also sort of physical and medical-based constructs that play into effort, individuals' ability to, to, to give effort, level of arousal, pain, these kinds of factors play into effort. And then the uh, sort of the, the construct that I am most interested in is that bottom one. And I'm going to dig into that one more toward the end of the, of the, uh, of the talk. So the, the first, you know, you think about salience. When we look at, when we think about neuroplasticity and the brain's ability to change itself, which is sort of at the basis for everything we do in neurorehabilitation, 
salience is one of the primary principles of neurorehabilitation, and it simply means are the interventions that we're providing meaningful to the person served? Are they engaging their attentional resources? Are they in it? Is it real? Are we making it as real as possible for that person served? That's what salience means. Therapeutic alliance and rapport, and person-centered rehabilitation. There was, uh, just in January of 2022, there was a scoping thematic review of person-centered rehabilitation. It was the first in rehab. Um, it was published in the archives, and I'll give you that reference later in the, the presentation. We'll talk about some more specifically some of the things that that, that study, or that that scoping review um, found in terms of what's important. This is the on with life level of effort uh, scale. The on with life level of effort scale is a seven point Likert scale, one being very, very low effort. So for example, our individuals who come to us with a disorder of consciousness, um, for whom we are primarily providing passive re rehabilitation interventions, they would receive a rating of one. Individuals who are all in, who, are, who come um, fully engaged, fully participatory in that therapy session would get a rating, an effort rating of seven. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on the level of effort scale. The, the, the story behind this is that back in 20, late 2014, early 2015, we had a uh, company donate, not donate, loan us a piece of equipment to trial. And in exchange for their loaning us this piece of equipment, they wanted us to be able to give them information about how the use of that piece of equipment um, affected outcomes. And at the time, we did not have, our, our data analytics were not eloquent enough to be able to do that, to be able to correlate the use of this de specific device with FIM numbers, for example. And so I explained that to them, and I said, what I can do is I can give you some information about effort and how much effort individuals usually put forth in a therapy session as compared to how much effort they put forth when they use this particular device. And so that was the point at which we developed this, this scale, was to be able to give some feedback to this company. Fast forward a few years, um, and we changed EMRs. And because effort in engagement is sort of at the foundation of my leadership philosophy, um, we made effort a um, mandatory field in the EMR for all therapy sessions. So every time a therapist, PT, OT, speech, rec, music, does a therapy session, they give a, a level of effort rating. And at the time, really the, the primary reason why I wanted it was as a daily reminder how important it is. It wasn't, I didn't necessarily have the forethought to think, hey, we could study this. Um, it was more just a, a, a little reminder for the therapist, this is, this is important, and you need to be thinking about this. Um, we did do an inter-rater reliability uh, assessment on this scale. We used six scenarios. Um, all of the therapists rated the, the scenarios, and what we found was that the inter-rater reliability for the On With Life level of effort scale was 0.96, which is very, very good. Very, very high uh, inter-rater reliability. So that's the On With Life level of effort scale. If you want that, shoot me an email. I'll, you can have it. So this, now we're going to fast forward again to a few years ago. And we had been collecting this level of effort data for a while. Um, and the, I, I don't remember whose idea it was, but perhaps Dan Logan, it might have been Dan's, it might have been Gene's idea to, was, we need to look at this. And we need to look at this in terms of what it means for our outcomes. And so that's what we've been doing since about 2019, is we've been looking at this, taking this information, correlating it with outcomes. Uh, we partnered with the University of Iowa 
Um, Dr. Malik, Jim Malik, is uh, our principal investigator. Um, and the, the individuals that you see on that list um, have all been, in some way, very meaningfully involved in this research project. And again, we're in the, the process of completing final revisions on the paper for uh, submission to the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, which is an, an exciting thing. Uh, Newt Carter and Sarah Perry are, are both our partners from the University of Iowa, and they work in the, the Department of Biostatistics, and I sat through a number of Zoom meetings with them, but uh, stuff went right over my head. And I, I think even in one of those Zoom meetings, I said to them, you have to explain this to me like I'm four years old. This biostatistics stuff. So if you have questions about the biostatistics side of this, I'm not the person to be answering those questions. We have both Joe and Dan are here, um, and they can answer those kinds of questions much more eloquently than I can. And there we go. All right, so. Again, the objective of the, the study was to, let's look at the role that effort plays in brain injury outcomes. We had about 101 persons served, 101 consecutive uh, admissions. These are individuals who came into our uh, inpatient program. Um, it was an observational cohort study, um, and I'll sort of explain that as, as we look at the results. Um, and the, the outcome measures that we used were the Mayo Portland Adaptability Inventory and the Supervision Rating Scale. And this is a quick summary of the Mayo Portland Adaptability Inventory. Again, it's a uh, sort of a global assessment, functional assessment of individuals. They receive, they come into our program, they receive uh, a Mayo Portland, the team does a Mayo Portland on them on admission. The team also does a Mayo Portland on them at discharge. Mayo Portland has multiple indexes. There's an ability index. There's a adjustment index. There's a, like a life participation index. And then there's a total score. Um, a couple of things to know. When you, when you take raw scores and you convert them to T-scores, one of the big things that we're looking for with the Mayo Portland is did that individual meet MCID, or minimally clinically important difference. And what minimally clinically important difference means is did they change enough? Did, was, is, was there enough of a T-score change? Was there enough change in function that it was meaningful both functionally and meaningful to that person served? That's the basic definition of MCID. Um, ideally, we also look at robust clinically important change, which is a, an even higher level of change. And these were um, a couple of the factors that were looked at as we, as we were um, considering outcomes and, and effort together. Supervision rating scale um, is a 13-point ordinance scale from um, one being completely independent, and 13 being this is an individual in restraints. And again, the SRS is, is completed upon admission to the inpatient program. It's, it's completed upon discharge from the inpatient program. And you've got your, your reference for that at the bottom. So what did we find? Um, strap in. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Words like... Um, propensity score don't roll easily off my, my tongue, so I'm, I'm going to uh, just bear with me here. When we looked at who gets better, and we look at what correlates to who gets better, this is some of what we found. Um, admission, Mayo Portland, if an individual has higher levels of impairment on admission, that is associated with higher levels of impairment at discharge. More impair impairment at admission is correlated to more impairment at discharge. Age, the lower the age at admission, that's correlated to higher, um, not higher, better function at discharge. 
It's higher and lower is difficult because on the Mayo Portland, if you say it's higher, that means they did worse. And so I always, it, I have to really think about this. Days from injury. The earlier we can get an individual after injury, the better they did functionally at discharge. We knew those things, or at least those kinds of things are fairly well known in the literature, fairly well understood in the literature. What wasn't as well understood was that mean level of effort rating was positively correlated with outcomes. And this is an exciting thing. This is a, this is a neat thing. The higher that mean, we took all of the individuals uh, level of effort ratings for their entire length of stay, found the mean, and that mean was positively correlated with outcomes. Um, things that were not significantly associated with uh, level of function at discharge included the standard deviation of the level of effort rating. So what that means is, some of you may be asking, why, why would you take all of those level of effort ratings and find an average? Is that really, is, is that a good way to do this? And what that means, that the, the fact that the standard deviation of level of effort was not correlated with um, function at discharge, that, that sort of, that tells you that variation didn't matter. If it didn't matter whether somebody gave very low effort at the beginning of rehab and high effort at the end, or if they had consistent effort across their rehab stay. It was the mean, not the variation, that was associated with, with uh, function at discharge. Um, sex condition, TBI versus non-traumatic brain injury, length of stay, and whether an individual was tre treated before or during the COVID pandemic. This happened to be a cohort for whom a number of these individuals were treated immediately prior to COVID. Some were treated a little bit before and a little bit during the COVID pandemic, and some were treated completely within the, the COVID pandemic. And what we found was that when they were treated, there, there was no correlation to, to outcome, which was a little bit surprising. I actually intuitively sort of thought individuals who were treated in COVID would have had lower um, function, would have had uh, lower discharge, higher discharge in Mayo Portland. All right, discharge uh, supervision rating scale. Um, significantly associated with admission SRS, so this similar to the previous slide, the, the lower someone, the more impaired someone is on admit, the more impaired they are at discharge. Age, again, lower age um, was correlated with a better outcome. And then the new, which we assumed those bottom two, the, the, the new information the kind of cool information is that mean LOE is also associated with better, and lower levels of supervision at the time of discharge. So if we could, what this one is saying was, if we could increase that mean level of effort by one point, on that seven point Likert scale, if we could increase that by one point, that correlated to an improvement in Mayo Portland of 5.1 on the total score, which is MCID. Five points on Mayo Portland is your minimally clinically important difference. That's a big deal. One point in effort. An improvement of one point in effort was correlated with a 1.5 increase in supervision or decrease in supervision. Individuals required a, a lower level of, of supervision, which is also a big deal. You're 8.34 times higher to achieve MCID with every one point of increase in effort. And this is the, f the first bullet, top bullet there is saying essentially the the more impairment on admission, the lower the effort. Low, lower function on admission meant individuals, it was associated with lower levels of effort, which is intuitive to some degree. Now, the thing I'm most excited about in this study 
is that bottom bullet. And again, that's a phrase that doesn't roll off the tongue easily. Limited exploratory propensatory score analysis. What that means, um, you know, when, in order to, th there's a big difference functionally between correlative data, right? This is correlated with that and causative, right? That, that's a big jump in the world we live in for being, being able to say that, that effort is correlated to outcomes. That's a very different statement than effort by, by improving effort, we can cause improvement in outcomes. And generally, when you do a study and you're trying to determine causality, you need to do what's called a double-blind, placebo-controlled um, study, which essentially means you have a control group that receives a treatment. And you have a treatment group, or you have a control group that does not receive a treatment. You have a treatment group that receives the treatment. Nobody knows which is which. And at the end of the day, what you find is that the treatment group changed and the control group did not. Right? That's how you determine causality. So that, when you, when you think about that type of a study, that's incredibly difficult to do when you're talking about effort. It's not like we can withhold effort from, you know, or, or try to get less effort out of some person served and more effort out of others. What exploratory propensatory score analysis does is it takes a observational cohort study, which is the type of study that we did. It's not like we provided a treatment to some and we didn't to others. Um, and it slices and dices the factors in a way that causality can be implied. And at this point, because we only had 101, uh, an N of 101, all we can say is that there's a potential causal effect. But that association was strong enough that using this analysis, there's a chance that this could be causal. And so that's really the next stage. We need to get them more more data so that we can hopefully give them a robust enough N to be able to, to eventually say that it's, it's causal. And if you had an intervention that you knew could, in, could, could if, if you used that intervention, it would result in MCID, meaningful change, not only functionally, but meaningful in terms of that person's perception that they have improved. You would use it. You would use it with every person served that you, that you encounter. And it would be incredibly cool, we're not there yet, but it would be incredibly cool if we could get there with effort. All right, moving on, and again, with all of my presentations, I try to send you home with something in your pocket. And um, so that's what sort of the, the rest of this presentation is going to be, is so what, right? So, so we know this about effort, so, so what, what next? Um, so again, I want to take, you probably remember that graphic from earlier in the, in the presentation. I wanna dig more into this idea of the concept of treatment design and how treatment design plays into effort. H how do we get effort? What are the concrete ways in which we can jump down into that hole and help them climb out together? Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about PCR, which stands for Person-Centered Rehabilitation, and EDSO competencies. There we go. So what is, I'm gonna start with person-centered rehabilitation. And again, I'm gonna give you the reference for the January 2022 archives scoping review in, in the next slide. So in general, when we think about what is person-centered rehabilitation, person-centered rehabilitation is this, you know, from, from, a, from the 10,000 foot level, it's the idea of a shift in mindset from providing rehabilitation to an individual, 
to providing rehabilitation with. We're moving from to to with, right? We're not standing above the hole and dropping our interventions in. We're jumping into the hole and we're climbing out together. Um, emphasis is placed, primary emphasis is placed on the experience of the person served as they move through the rehabilitation continuum. What is their experience? And making that experience the best it can possibly be is top priority. Um, during the scoping review, they sort of divided PCR into three levels. You know, first and foremost, there's the person professional dyad. So that relationship, that therapeutic alliance, that rapport that you have with the person you serve. There are factors that play into that that are either person-centered or not person-centered. Microsystem level. The team, the way your team functions either lends itself well or lends itself not well to person-centered rehabilitation. Back in the fall, I talked a little bit about the, how the words we use within our organizations are incredibly important. And the words we and they form boundaries of teams. Right? We and they form the boundaries of our teams. So if one department is we and the other department is they, that, that mindset does not lend itself well to person-centered rehabilitation. If one shift is we and another shift is they, that does not lend itself well toward person-centered rehabilitation. We are one team. We are not separate pieces. Inpatient is not we, outpatient is not they. Ankeny is not we, Glenwood is not they. We are we. Um, and, and it's easy for me to stand up here and say it, but in real life it's, it's very hard. It's very hard to sort of move away from the, that thought process. But it's of paramount importance if you're going to function as an organization in a way that forms that foundational mindset that informs how we regard the people we serve. Um, so that's the microsystem level. Macrosystem level has to do with organizational priorities. What, what do the policies that we create, do the strategic goals that we set, do the decisions that we make at a leadership level, at an organizational level, allow our staff to work in a person-centered way? And so when I think about this, I think about, um, you know, I was just, we, we were having a conversation about our admissions process. And one of the things that usually happens in our admissions process is that person served and family come in, family goes and there's a bunch of paperwork and a bunch of orientation stuff that the family does while the person served is going through all their initial evaluative sort of processes. And when you step back and you think about that, maybe we need to rethink that. Right? When is it important for the family to be there? It's important for them to be there at, in those early minutes and hours to be a part of that initial evaluative process. And it's, it's and my guess is all of you could, can think of very specific examples in which the procedures that you use in your organization sort of fly in the face of this idea of person-centered, being person-centered. Like, we have things we have to accomplish, but the fact that we do it the way we do it detracts from the experience that that person served in family are having. So that's macro system level. There's your, your reference. Um, 
this was, this study or the scoping review is the first that's ever been done in, in the rehabilitation. There have been lots of scoping reviews on person-centered care. It's a buzzword in healthcare. There have been scoping reviews in person-centered dentistry and person-centered emergency care and person-centered nursing care. Uh, but this is the first one in person-centered rehab. And uh, there were some really interesting things in the article. I would encourage you to, to sit down and read it uh, because it's, it's pretty darn insightful. Um, and one of the points that they make is that, to, um, to a point, if you ask any rehabilitation provider if they're person-centered, the, the, the response will be yes. We, we all think that we're person-centered. But what they found was that there's, there is a, a, a gap in perception between whether we as providers think that we're person-centered and what our, what our person-served and families think. Um, there, there's a little bit of a disconnect there. And, and I, the underlying message is we all have room to improve. And I went into this article thinking we've got this. Right? As I read this article, we, we've, this is what we do. And I was surprised um, and uh, a little humbled by the things that we don't. So, again, <laughs> here's that, that picture. I'll, I'll explain that picture here in just a minute. Person-centered rehabilitation avoids protocolization and prescription, right? And that's a hard thing to read because that's our safe zone. As, as healthcare providers, as rehabilitation, give me the cookbook. Tell me what I'm supposed to do first. Tell me what I'm supposed to do second. Tell me what I'm supposed to do third, right? What's session one supposed to look like? Session two, tell me what to do. Give me the list of, of from A to C, that I need to do to make this person better, and I'll apply it to everyone. That is not person-centered rehabilitation. It's not that there aren't protocols that are important. There are some evidence-based protocols that are, are very important, but if you are the kind of clinician who thrives in that protocol, this that my, my hope is that maybe this will push you outside your comfort zone. Every individual is different. One protocol should not be applied to everyone we see. Um, it prioritizes the relationship over all else. And they reinforce this multiple times in the article. Relationship over all else. And the example, the specific example that they used in the article was this. Um, the goal of the initial evaluation, think about, for those of you who are clinicians, think about what your goal is when you f go in for that initial evaluation. What they assert is that the goal for your initial evaluation should be to make a connection, to build chips, to build rapport, to start forming that therapeutic alliance, that should be the primary goal of that initial evaluation, right? And for most of us as clinicians, we think the goal of the initial evaluation is to collect data, right? I, as a speech therapist, my initial evaluation, I gotta get in there, I gotta figure out what they can drink and what they can eat so that I can get that information to the, the kitchen and I can get it in the medical record, right? That's what's on my mind from a clinical standpoint in terms of what's important in that initial evaluation. That's, we have to start to flip our thinking and focus on the importance of making and building connections with the people we serve from, from moment one. Connects with the person served outside of required time. So Kathy Herring uh, was one of our founding families and uh, was our admissions coordinator for many, many years at On With Life. And Kathy, 20 some years after it occurred, would regularly tell a story about, and, and for those of you who aren't aware, On With Life 
Um, when, when Kathy and the founding families were sort of thinking about conceptualizing what they wanted On With Life to be and how they wanted On With Life to function, much of that was based on Kathy's experience with her son, Rob, as he was going through uh, annual evaluations at Craig Rehabilitation um, back in the 1980s. And Kathy often told the story of uh, one day she was sitting in the cafeteria by herself, eating lunch, and one of Rob's physicians happened by with a cup of coffee. And he sat down and just talked to her for 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. He sat there and just, just had a conversation with her. And the fact that he did that, the fact that he sat down with her at a time that he, you know, he wasn't required to sit down with her and had a conversation about something other than Rob and Rob's condition, that had a profound effect on Kathy. And again, it was 15 minutes out of that physician's time, but Kathy was still talking about it 25 years after it actually happened. It made that big of a difference. So that when I read that in the article, I, that story from Kathy immediately came to mind. Requires the professional to be a little bit vulnerable. The picture you see up there is uh, from every year, with the exception of 2020 and 2021, we did a, uh, what's called a sweetheart dinner. It's a Valentine's Day celebration. Person served, get dressed up. Their families get dressed up. Uh, staff help uh, make up. They do, uh, we have a photo booth. And this year we, is the first year that we did a dance. We sort of did a combined um, sweetheart dinner and a dance party afterwards. And that person served. It, it, it is a miracle that we, I, I, don't, I don't know that any of us in the first few months would have ever thought that we would have gotten that picture from that person served. He's a little grumpy. Um, <laughs> and what it required was for that therapist to be just a little bit vulnerable. And as soon as she was a little bit vulnerable, that's what the result was. And we, from this year on, we will do a dance party at every sweetheart dinner. It was, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. All right, so that's PCR again. I would highly encourage you. There's a lot more in that article uh, than what I shared. Um, so I would highly encourage you to, to check it out. On to the next topic, EDSO. And again, I presented on this a number of years ago, so I don't, I'm not going to belabor this. So I'll get through it relatively quickly. Um, back when I started thinking about this idea of effort and the importance of effort, the importance of engagement in rehabilitation, um, and started thinking about how do I take this sort of fuzzy concept of effort, of engagement, and make it a little bit more concrete and start to focus on what that means in terms of how we think about what we do with our person served, um, I just coincidentally was asked to do the professionalism in service at On With Life. Um, and I knew nothing about professionalism, so I went to the library and I checked out some books. And two of the books that I checked out were Start With Why and Leaders Eat Less. Both of them are by a, an author, public speaker named Simon Sinek. And Start With Why is all about aligning your why with your organization's why. So that story that I told earlier about my doing dreams, that doing dream, one of the reasons I've been it on with life for 20 years is because that doing dream aligns itself well with the mission of On With Life. I've, I've found this organization that my why aligns well with my organization's why. So anyway, that was one of them. The other one was Leaders Eat Last. And Leaders Eat Last has a lot of information, but I specifically keyed in on this idea of EDSO. EDSO is an acronym. It stands for endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. And 
these are, when, when we think about that life is good feeling, I hope that all of you have had this experience where you just, you feel good, you feel happy, you, you feel content. That, those feelings are the direct result of neurotransmitters. And the, the, there are a lot of neurotransmitters that are involved in that. Um, this is a big time oversimplification of that, but these are some of the biggies. Um, endorphins we get from exercise, dopamine we get from set, setting and meeting goals, uh, serotonin we get from growth, and oxytocin we get from giving back. And so I read these books, I applied them um, to the professionalism in service, and sort of left it at that. At the time, I sort of left it with that. And a couple of weeks later, I had to step into a speech therapy session. We had an outpatient speech, uh, individual who was there for outpatient speech. Her name was Mary. Her clinician went home sick, and so I stepped in sort of cold and had to do this therapy session. And I didn't know anything about Mary at the time. I read very quickly her previous note. I knew that they were working on executive function, so I sat down with Mary, and we started to do a, a sort of a rote executive functioning problem-solving reasoning task. Um, and within four or five minutes, I re realized that Mary wasn't having it. I wasn't getting effort. I wasn't getting engagement out of Mary. And so I, I stopped and, and I just asked a little bit, you know, again, when you think about PCR, I was going into that interaction thinking, what do I need to accomplish during this session, right? Instead of going into that session thinking, what does she need? How do I make her experience the best it can possibly be? And so I, I, I sort of sat back, I said, Mary, tell me about yourself. You know, talk to me about who you are, sort of what's, what's your story. And these are the things she shared. She was about a year post. Um, her husband was a severe alcoholic, lots of issues at home. Uh, she gained about 35 pounds in the year since her injury. And most of her time she spent at home watching television. And so after we'd talked for a couple of minutes, I said, well, okay. Mary, we have about a half an hour left in this session. What's one thing, if we could accomplish one thing in the next half hour that would make you feel like your time with me was well spent, that your time with me was worth it? What's that, what's one thing that we can accomplish? And she said, I just wanna be happier. And I thought, crap. <laughs> what, what, what am I gonna do with that, right? But I had just given this, you know, two weeks prior, I had just done this professional, professionalism in services on EDSO, all of the, well, uh, uh, some of the, the neurotransmitters that um, result in the feeling of happiness. And so I t sort of talked through EDSO with her, and I'll, at the, at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll talk through sort of what the outcome of that session was. So let's take just a couple of minutes and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about EDSO. Um, e is for endorphins. And again, when you get your heart rate up, endorphins are the natural result. Endorphins are, um, from a biological standpoint, endorphins are a, uh, they're a painkiller designed to block pain. The runner's high comes from an endorphin rush. And um, so what I did, was I created competencies. Competencies for the therapist, and, and it, they don't work like normal competencies do. They're more of a self-check, a self-assessment. So on an annual basis, all of the therapists go through their EDSO competency sort of self-check, um, to sort of gut check and, and remind them, you know, am I doing these things? So, the EDSO competencies have to do with physical exercise. How, how often and how concretely are we addressing physical activity in our rehabilitation? How often are we getting that heart rate up? Are we engaging them in community-based activities that get that heart rate up? 
Are we doing groups that get the heart rate up? Are we using, you know, there's all kinds of technology that we can use now that can track movement, track activity. Are we helping them understand that and helping instill that goal in them? Um, I, my days are better when I run. I'm a, I, I run, I, I run in the mornings and my days are better when I run. I ran, because I was giving this presentation this morning, I was a little bit stressed about it, I ran this morning and it helped. Are we helping our person served feel those same things? So those are the endorphin-based competencies. Dopamine. Um, usually when we think about dopamine, we think about it in a negative way, right? Alcohol is a dopaminergic. The various drugs are dopaminergic. Dopamine, um, anthropologically speaking, was, was, is there to help us achieve our goals. Right? A lot of us are, we, we like visual goals. I, you, you all, if you're a list maker, you know what it feels like to cross something off your list. You get a little shot of dopamine. That's why it feels good. I was at Menards not long ago. I was in the aisle. Walking down the aisle, I had my list. I saw furnace filters. I needed furnace filters. They weren't on the list. I put furnace filters in the cart. I wrote it on the list, and I crossed it out. <laughs> I like the dopamine. Um, so again, what are we doing from a clinical standpoint to give, uh, to, to help our person served experience this, right? Are we writing visible goals? Are we giving, are we writing them with them? Are we writing them together? During sessions, during interactions, are we reminding them that they're getting closer to their goals? Right? Are we giving that feedback in every session? Are we ensuring that our person served are leaving those sessions feeling as though they've succeeded? Right? I had, back when I was doing more treating, I sort of had a pattern to my sessions. First five minutes of the session, we're gonna do something that's, that I know that person served is going to be six, very successful at. As close to 100% as possible. So we're gonna start positive. I'm gonna hit them with the hard stuff in the middle, and then the last five minutes, we're gonna do something that I know that they're gonna be 100% successful at. They're leaving that session feeling as though they've succeeded. Um, are we incorporating music? We have the tremendous blessing of having a music therapist on staff at On With Life. Music, we all have specific songs that we love specific songs that we listen to over and over and over. We do that because we get a little shot of dopamine when we hear a song that we like. So are we incorporating music? Serotonin, serotonin's all about growth. It's all about doing more, being more, increasing value, increasing self-confidence. When we um, have groups come in, I often will have a person served and family come and talk to that group. And I do that, number one, to help the group better understand brain injury, but I do that, number two, because when you think about one of the biggest battles that we fight with the people we serve, it's this idea of victim mentality, right? I am my diagnosis, and my diagnosis has taken away my value. And that is not necessarily true. And putting a person served and a family member in front of a group of people tells that person served that they, while they may not have asked for this thing to have happened to them, while they may not have wanted this thing to have happened to them, this experience has given them value. They have something to give. So we've got some competencies specifically related to how are we building their self-confidence? How, how are we reminding them that they have something to give? That they're a person, of, they are not their diagnosis. Last one's oxytocin. Oxytocin is all about personal connection. Um, it's, it's about giving of your time, giving of your energy. 
and not expecting anything in return. Doing something kind for someone else, if you're on the receiving end of that. So the second thing I did this morning, because I was a little bit nervous about getting up here and presenting, was when I was at Come and Go, everybody at On With Life knows that I, I go to Come and Go every morning, um, I, I, I always get my 44 ounce diet, seven up, I, that's, that's my vice. But I paid for mine, and I paid for the person behind me. And doing that, giving of my resources without expecting anything in return, it gave the person behind me a little shot of oxytocin. It gave me a little shot of oxytocin. And it gave the clerk. The, the cool thing about oxytocin is if you, not only the person on the receiving end and the person on the giving end get a shot of oxytocin, but anyone who witnesses gets a little shot of oxytocin, and it increases the likelihood that you will do something nice, something kind, to someone else during the course of the day. Um, and we have some competencies specifically related to that, right? How are we putting person served in situations where they can give back? where they can give of their time, where they can give of their energy, where they aren't just receivers of care. They aren't just on the receiving end. They're also on the other end. So those are the EDSO competencies. Back to Mary. So I, I talked through some of these things with Mary, and the first thing that we did was we made a list. So we've hit dopamine. Got dopamine taken care of. We're gonna write a list. Um, the second thing that she, you know, when we talked about endorphins, Mary used to walk. She used to wa walk a mile a day before her injury, and she hadn't walked since she got hurt. Not because she couldn't walk, just because she didn't. And so Mary set a goal that between now and the next speech therapy session, she was going to walk a half a mile. She wrote that on her list. So we've got dopamine and we've got endorphins. Serotonin. Value, self-confidence, self-worth, getting rid of that idea of victim mentality. Um, Mary had been an Al-Anon leader prior to her, her injury, and she hadn't been to an Al-Anon meeting in the year since she'd gotten hurt. So she set a goal that she was going to attend one Al-Anon meeting between that speech therapy session and the next one. Um, so we've got serotonin. Oxytocin, Mary was a cook. She uh, had a new neighbor and she, like her specialty was pies. And so she decided she was gonna cook, a, bake a pie and give it to this, this neighbor. And I happened to, I, I ran into Mary, I popped back down, it was a couple of weeks later, just to ask her how she was doing. And she had accomplished all of her goals, and she had set a few more, and it hadn't fixed Mary's life. Mary's life wasn't all better. This isn't a Hallmark movie. But Mary readily admitted that she was a little bit happier. And she was happier because I had taken the time and put forth the effort to jump down in that hole, right? I'd moved away from dropping my, whole, my interventions down the hole to her and had taken the time to jump into that hole and climb out. It's, it's uncomfortable and it requires some vulnerability and most of us associate vulnerability with risk, right? I don't want to be vulnerable because that opens me up to risk. But guys, you can't have joy without vulnerability either. That's all I've got. Anybody have questions?
So one of the questions from the chat was how much more data and study will be needed to complete the study? How much more data do you need to complete the study? Well, number one, I don't know that the study will ever be complete. I, I, my goal would be that it's never complete, right? We, we, it gets better and better and better ongoing. What, uh, Joe, do you have any sense? Do we need, how many more other than the N of 101 do we need in order to be able to do a big enough for a exploratory propensity, whatever it is, to, to be able to Give Joe just a second. Get a mic to him. Yeah, in, in research, I don't know if the end is as significant as now that we've got some findings, can others replicate them, right? If they can be replicated, that's really where the knowledge will elevate to say, this is a consistent finding among different populations. We've got, at this point, I think we have another couple hundred folks that haven't been, that we have have not yet sort of put into this, either the correlative, uh, the, the correlative study. So we have, we have ad additional individuals. We're just pretty bogged down in what we're already doing. So hopefully that will be to come. Any other questions? Anybody else? All right, I'll be around for, for a little bit. This is my, my email address if you're interested in the LOE, the level of effort rating scale. Again, you're welcome to it. Um, or if you have other questions, you can shoot them to me by email or catch me during the day. Again, thank you for your, thank you for your attention. Thanks for being here.